Welcome. This is Lighthouse Lab Services. My name is John Harrell. I'm the president of Lighthouse Lab Services. And I have Tara Llewellyn, our manager of our laboratory director program here with me. And today we're going to go through how to fill out a CLIA application, a CMS 116 form. We're going to focus today on filling this out as a new application. So if you're starting a new medical laboratory that's going to be doing diagnostic testing, you will need a CLIA certificate and we're gonna walk through how to fill that out. This form is also used um, beyond being an initial application for changes to your test menu or certificate type or change to your lab director um, would also be using this form. So on section one, we are gonna focus on what is required when you um, submit your application. You're gonna to need to put in your facility name, you're going to need to put in an email address and a tax ID number. Your federal tax ID number is going to need to match the facility name that you use. So try to stay away from using DBAs and use the actual name of um, the company as it's listed with the federal tax ID number. Uh, email address and phone number are also required. And uh, the location that's listed here needs to be the location that the laboratory will be present at. Um, they could and sometimes do, especially if you're applying for Medicare, do a brick and mortar check to make sure that this is a legitimate um, brick and mortar location. And they'll often look for a sign. So the, the sign should match um, the facility name that you list ideally. Um, so you, that's the information you're gonna fill out in section one. Um, you will also need to supply the name of your laboratory director at this point. And Tara can tell you a little bit about the credentials required for that. So on section one of this form, you will need to list your lab director's first and last legal names, as well as their middle initial, as well as their credential. And depending on the level of complexity of the testing that you're applying to do in-house, your lab director will need a different level of education and, or experience. Um, for moderate complexity labs, uh, your lab director is going to need at least a bachelor's degree and a few years of experience in the testing that you do, as well as some training. For high complexity labs, you need a board certified doctoral level director, and you will need to supply all of these credentials uh, attached to your CMS 116 form when you submit that to CLIA to verify that the lab director is properly credentialed. And of course, if you have questions about uh, your lab director, if they're qualified and or if you need lab director services, you can certainly contact us at Lighthouse to assist with it. Yes, thanks, Sarah. Uh, one other thing to note is it is going to ask for your CLIA number here. You will not have one as this is your initial application that's going to be issued to you based on approval of this form. But if you are making a change, you would include your CLIA application number or identification number there. Um, section two is where you're gonna select the type of application that you're requesting. Uh, a certificate of waiver is used for FDA approved CLIA waive testing. So um, you're gonna to need to know what your test menu is. That's for very simple tests, typically point of care tests, um, uh, pregnancy rapid strap, those typically fall into that certificate of waiver um, category. The certificate of uh, provider performed microscopy is for a physician or an MD that is looking to use a microscope in their office. Uh, certificate of compliance is uh, if you're applying directly to your local CLIA office for oversight. And a certificate of accreditation is if you would like to uh, apply and be inspected by a deemed agency of um, CMS. And the uh, agencies that are allowed are listed here, which would be the Joint Commission, CAP, uh, AOA, COLA, AABB, ASHI, and ATULA. Um, we have the most experience using CAP and COLA. CAP, we would recommend not for an initial application, but maybe for a laboratory that's been around for a little while. The requirements for that are pretty intense and uh, usually do not make sense for a new lab um, just starting up, and it's going to be hard to satisfy the requirements. So you might want to upgrade to CAP at some point down the road. COLA is a great idea. We uh, often put many of our labs through COLA and COLA is a little bit more consultative in their approach to helping a lab get started and uh, make sure that they're doing their testing appropriately. And they're a little bit more likely to answer a question that you might have 
There's going to be things that are up to your interpretation on regulations from the CMS guidelines, and COLA will give you some guidance on that, whereas if you're dealing with your local CMS office, we've found that they will typically just read you a regulation but not interpret it, and I think that they haven't given authority to the local um, branch representatives to interpret uh, for in intentional reasons. And so uh, we recommend going with COLA. It will cost you a little bit more, um, but not a, not a big number, a few hundred dollars a year on average. Section three is the type of laboratory. Um, pretty self-explanatory, so you're gonna find the type of organization that you are and check the appropriate box. Uh, most common for us is dealing with either hospital CLIAs, uh, which is number 14. Independent labs would be the most common, and that would be a typical for-profit laboratory. Um, and that's section number 15. And then uh, physician office lab and practitioner other are both often used. If you're looking to do an in-house lab inside of a clinic or a behavioral health center, you would select uh, options 21 or 22. When you're trying to determine as a physician, if you're looking to own a laboratory, your choices are typically between numbers 15 and 21, and there are some ramifications to what you choose here and some laws. And so uh, as a physician, if you choose to own an independent laboratory, you cannot send your own patient samples to that laboratory or else that would be considered an inducement and has um, pretty serious consequences. So you want to be aware of that. If you are a physician office laboratory, that is to serve your patients, and you would not, um, say, hire a sales force or take samples from other groups. There are times when you are allowed to accept samples from other physicians, but you cannot provide them any remuneration back to them. And, um, you know, disclaimer that we're not lawyers, but we're just given kind of our guidance on what we know from doing this for the last uh, 16 years and filling out this form quite a bit. Um, but we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about that um, and are available to fill out this form for you. We do this for free for any of our laboratory director clients. We provide the medical laboratory director of record to over 150 labs around the country, and uh, we'd be happy to help you with that and fill this form out at no cost if uh, we're providing that lab director. And we can typically do that in uh, one to two business days. Uh, but that's the uh, section three. Let us know if you have any questions. You'll see our name and number at the bottom of the, uh, of the screen there. Um, Tara, can you tell us a little bit more about Section 4? Yes. For Section 4, you want to list the hours of laboratory testing that is happening in the lab. These are the times that your lab is going to be running testing in-house. Um, so you want to be sure to be very specific about the days and times that you are planning to be open to run specimens. Um, there is a box there to check if you will be running specimens 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, otherwise, you're going to fill out each day, Sunday through Saturday, and each time, uh, the time that you'll start testing and the time you'll end testing each day. Um, it could be different each day depending on when your staff is there to run specimens, but you do want to be very specific here because any time that you listed as being open and operational in this section, you could receive a surprise visit by the CLIA office, a CLIA inspector, um, and our representative. And so you want to make sure that there is someone on site during those times just in case there would be any unexpected drop-in or um, for scheduling your inspections moving forward. Additionally, Perfect. if uh, you offer, uh, I'm sorry, additionally, if you are um, a shared office lab or you are sharing your laboratory testing space with another lab that has a separate CLIA license, typically those operate on separate days um, and you just want to make sure that, again, you're not overlapping on the times there if you do happen to be in a shared laboratory space. If you have questions about this, um, we'd be happy to answer those as well. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks, Tara. Um, section 5 is pretty much going to always be a no. We've filled out this form, you know, greater than 50 times, and uh, I think there's only been one time that we were not a no on Section 5, and that was for a long-term care lab that was going to be providing uh, multiple CLIA-waived locations in the long-term care center so that they could put a centrifuge to spin blood before they um, took the samples home and do some point-of-care testing out in the field. Um, and so, for the most part, you're going to be a no here. 
um, if you do fall into that boat, the instructions are pretty simple and there's a list of uh, exemptions that you can uh, meet, one, two, or three, and uh, then you would need to list the addresses of every location where that testing is performed. If you have more than will fit on this page, you can attach an addendum there. Um, section six is for wave testing. Wave testing, like we said, is, is very simple, typically point of care testing, and you're gonna list the type of testing and the device that you're gonna use um, for that box there. Section seven is for PPM, that's provider performed microscopy, and uh, that's for physicians that are gonna use microscope in their clinic um, to do some testing. You will need to indicate your estimated test volume um, at this time on that, that is an estimate. Um, section eight is for non-wave testing. So this is where most people will fall. If you're not a wave lab, you're gonna be either a moderate or high complexity lab. You can determine whether you're moderate or high based on the testing type that you're doing as well as the platform or the instrumentation and equipment that you're using. So if you're using a FDA approved instrument and your test is considered an IVD, in vitro diagnostic, you're gonna be moderate complexity in the uh, qualifications of your laboratory director as well as your testing personnel will reflect that. We do have a map of all 50 states at lighthouselabservices.com that you can click on that will show you the staffing um, requirements for both moderate and high complexity for each state. Um, note that there are some states that do not recognize moderate complexity testing. So even if your testing type is an IVD, it's FDA approved and would be considered moderate, if your state doesn't recognize it, you're probably gonna fall into the high complexity category, which means you're gonna trigger the requirements for staffing for high complexity and need a high complexity lab director, testing personnel, et cetera. I'm happy to help with questions about that because it does get tricky, but uh, con assuming that nothing is outside the ordinary, um, this is where you would fill in your testing type as well as the instruments that you're gonna use uh, to do that testing uh, would be done here. Again, you can um, attach a separate page if it gets long and you need to. Um, you're also gonna need to check your subspecialty type. Fairly self-explanatory, but not really. Uh, for some areas, micro, or sorry, molecular is the fastest growing area that we experienced for lab testing, and it doesn't have a category. Uh, it'll normally fall underneath microbiology. However, it could also fall under clinical gen, uh, genetics at times. So you're gonna select whatever is appropriate, but um, besides that, you should be able to figure out uh, your testing type based on um, based on the boxes that are provided here for you to check. Uh, you will also need to provide an estimate of total test volume at this time. My guidance on this is to um, estimate low. The way that it works for your CLIA fee is gonna be based on your total test volume. You're probably gonna see a fee somewhere in the $1,500 to $2,500 range. Um, if you're using uh, certificate of accreditation, We'll be paying a fee to the accrediting body as well. And like I said, on total, it'll be a little bit higher, but you do get some benefits as a result of that. Um, but this is where you put that estimated test volume. They're gonna verify that when they do their inspection. Um, they're gonna do an initial inspection at six months, six to nine months on average. And then you're gonna be inspected every two years after that. And based on your actual test volume is what you'll pay to a point. If you uh, estimate a number here, and you end up doing less tests than that, you're not gonna get any kind of refund. Uh, however, if you do estimate on the low side and you end up doing more testing, you'll just pay for the difference. So that's why we would um, counsel you to, to shoot a little bit low. This is not the time to be real optimistic. Um, section nine, the type of control, I think it's self-explanatory. Most groups we work with fall into the for-profit category, but if you're a, uh, a nonprofit hospital or other nonprofit, you'd fall into that uh, voluntary nonprofit section and government agency. They're also uh, listed here as well. And then Tara, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, section 10? Yeah, section 10, uh, you're going to need to list your director's other affiliations with labs. 
So if the director that you have hired is also serving as a CLIA laboratory director for any other CLIA licensed facilities, whether that be moderate or high complexity, uh, you're going to need to list those affiliations in this section. Uh, you will need to include the CLIA number and the name of each laboratory, um, and there are several boxes there for you to do so. Uh, if you uh, work with us here at Lighthouse to um, receive lab director services, that's something that we'll provide um, and can work with you to get that from the laboratory director. If not, you know, you just talk to your laboratory director, make sure you understand all of his or her other affiliations and you include those on this page. Uh, CLIA here is trying to determine and ensure that your laboratory director is not overseeing more than five laboratories, as that is the federal maximum allowed for lab directors to oversee. Some states have uh, few, allow fewer lab directorships per director than that, but that's the general guideline here. And then finally, at the bottom, um, you are going to print the name of the owner and the director of the lab, and then it requires one signature, either of the owner or the lab director. I would encourage you here to have your lab director sign this form. Um, it will be acceptable for any of the ownership group to sign here instead. However, we are seeing local CLIA offices request that if the owner of the lab in lieu of the lab director signing the uh, CMS 116 form here, um, they will ask that the lab director sign a um, wedding signature, a letter or statement stating that they are indeed uh, agreeing to work with the laboratory in this capacity. And, and this is to ensure that uh, the lab director is on board, is signing up, um, and, and is willing to work with the lab in this capacity. We've seen in the past where some labs um, have put forth a lab director and actually the lab director has no knowledge of that. And so um, sometimes it's easy to obtain those credentials and go ahead and apply. And, and previously with the owners being able to simply sign by themselves, um, that, you know, we were seeing that happen. And so now the CLIA offices are uh, are, are ensuring and double checking that the laboratory directors are on board before approving the application. So the best thing to do here to avoid that additional corroboration um, needed by the CLIA office is just to have your laboratory director sign in wet ink before you submit the application. Great point, thanks Tara. Um, so that, that's the basics of it. When you do send this in, you're gonna need to send it along with your laboratory directors uh, resume as well as a copy of their board certification, but do not send in any payment with it at this time. They're going to let you know what you owe once they process your application. You're also not allowed to start testing until you um, receive approval from the CLIA office. So you can send off this application. You're probably going to wait 30 to 45 days on average, depending on uh, the local office that you um, submit to. Some of them take longer, some are quicker. Um, you also are allowed to in most states, so there are California is one that you're not, but in most states you're allowed to go ahead and start with um, the validation. It, ahead, You could send this application in prior to your validation, right? So you can go ahead, send this in, get your equipment, get the supplies you need and start validating. So you are running tests, but those are not diagnostic tests on human samples, right? So you cannot run anything diagnostic and report it out until you have been approved of your, uh, your CLIA application has been approved. Um, that rule for California and New Jersey is a little bit different where they want you to um, go ahead and do your validation and include your validation study along with your application. Um, and so that's, that's the basics of it. Hopefully you guys found that helpful. We do have more information on our website, lighthouselabservices.com. We do have blogs and articles there. We have an article that's gonna be posted about the how-to on filling this out, which will have pictures and uh, more of a written description. So if you wanna reference that, I hope that's helpful. And uh, thank you. Let us know if we can help. Our phone number, 1-800-838-0602. And our email address is on the bottom of the screen there. If you have a question, give us a call. Um, we can help with this, as well as with validating and setting up your laboratory, supplying you with uh, scientists, supplying you with a lab director, and anything else that you might need. Thanks, and have a great day.